We have learned the basics of airships. This is an anti-Newton DC TIX. Makes sense. A transport airship with a zero carbon footprint. This is our future. Hello everyone. You are on the channel of Next Generation Airships. I am Yulia Shishkina. We have talked about many things, investments, finances, engines, but we haven't been able to get to airships, which is actually why we gathered on this channel. Today, we will eliminate ignorance. We will talk about airships with a person who knows everything about them and even a little more. This is the chief designer of airships, Vadim Vasilevich Zubkevich. Hello. Hello. Naturally, I will interrogate you on the topic of airships, but first I want to introduce the audience to you. Who are you? What do you do? What do you dedicate your life to? What did you study? And what is your job? I have been working with airships for over 40 years, and it all started back in my student years when I studied at Bauman Moscow State Technical University, then still known as Bauman Moscow State University. It was customary back then, and probably still is, though I don't know how the educational process is organized now. But back then, in addition to studying and gaining knowledge, students were also expected to try applying that knowledge in various fields. There was a student scientific and technical society that aimed to engage in pure science. They were engaged in various activities under the guidance of a teacher, conducting some research and writing papers and other related tasks. There was a student design bureau, and in this design bureau, there were numerous groups that aimed to create new technology. One of these groups was called GIALA, the Group for the Study of Aerostatic Flying Technology. It was led by Evgeny Trofimovich Mbida, and after the 1980 Olympics, as a third-year student, I joined this group and started working there. We created small devices, learned various things, and understood more as we participated in exhibitions. At that time, there was a nationwide movement for scientific and technical creativity among youth, and exhibitions of youth scientific and technical creativity were held, in which we participated. After that, I started working at the Dolgoprudny Design Bureau of Automation after graduating from the Institute in 1984. This was the only design bureau in the Soviet Union that dealt with aeronautical technology, such as... You want to say you've been directly involved with airships since your student years? Yes, of course, for over 40 years now. So there won't be some mind-blowing story about how this idea suddenly came to you? Was it planned from the very beginning? Well, I can't say it was planned, but that's how it happened. I ended up there because friends who worked there brought me, and I liked it, so I stayed. You are a rare person who starts their career path with something and continues with it for a lifetime. Aren't you tired of it? Is it that fascinating? No, you know, engineering creativity is fascinating in itself, very diverse, because there are different projects. Each project is new, everyone starts with a blank slate, so we create an ordinary life. But I can't say that I've been involved in aeronautics my whole life. I had a period, about 14 years I think, when I worked with underwater technology. But it's all very close. What are you talking about? We swim in the air, we swim underwater, it's pretty much the same. Just the density of the medium is different. By the way, indeed, speaking of the fact that there is always an incredibly varied, diverse and ever-changing and ever-evolving scope of work, how remarkably and distinctly different, in fact, are modern airships from those that appeared 100 years ago? What was an airship 100 years ago, and what is it in comparison today? Let's start even earlier than 100 years ago. In fact, a person first flew in the air not on devices that operate on a dynamic principle, like airplanes or helicopters, where lift is created by the incoming air, but rather on a device that operates on the aerostatic principle. Everyone starts with the Montgolfier brothers. This was, excuse me, in the 18th century. So in the 18th century, a person first flew in the air and began to fly. And the 19th century was actually the era of free balloons. They were very advanced, and people flew a lot. Not many people know, for example, that during the Franco-Prussian War, the Prussian troops completely blocked and besieged Paris. The only way the besieged Paris communicated with the rest of France was through free balloons. That is, people would indeed take flight and deliver some, I don't know, reports and information about that. The very word airship is indeed French. It literally means controlled in French. So there were free balloons that, for instance, fly at the will of the wind. 
We choose the right wind, ascend into the air, and fly, thanks to the aerostatic force, wherever the wind takes us. Of course, we choose the wind that carries us. As engines began to develop, and more powerful engines appeared, the question arose, why not fly against the wind? That is, the power of engines allowed for this, and somewhere in the second half of the 19th century, aerostatic flying machines with engines began to appear, which were already trying to fight against the wind and fly against it. At first, of course, the engines were very weak, and the speeds were small, 40 km h and 50, but progress continued, 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 and the classic era of airships is still. The period between the First and Second World Wars, when the largest airships were built, in which the most successful flights took place. Not many people again know that a person first reached the pole on what? Not with dogs, not in an airplane, but in an airship. This was, if I remember correctly, in 1927 or 1928. This was an expedition on the airship Norge, on the airships built by Nobel. These were very famous airships. But the largest domestic Soviet airship, SRV-6, was also built by Umberto Nobile, an Italian specialist. It was built under his supervision. For its time, it was an outstanding machine. Records for flight duration were set on it. Once, it flew, I believe, for 130 hours in the air. That's more than five days, can you imagine? Five days in the air for a flying machine. No other flying machine can do anything similar. Again, let's remember the era of Zeppelins, the most famous rigid airship of the Zeppelin type, the Graf Zeppelin Z127. It, I believe, indeed traveled to South America almost 130 times from Germany and back. That is Friedrichshafen, Buenos Aires and back. Can you imagine? It circled the globe with three intermediate landings. The problem with those airships was, so to speak, that they flew on hydrogen. Let's just talk a little about the aerostatic principle of flight now, because since it's lit best, let's explain everything, as they say, from Adam. The problem is, is it dangerous? Well, yes, as you know, hydrogen is dangerous. So what is aerostatics? As you might be aware, there is a gas that is lighter than air, and there is Archimedes' principle, which states that any body placed in a medium is pushed out of that medium floating with a force equal to the mass of the displaced medium. If it's water, its density is approximately about 1,000. Fresh water is roughly 1,000 kilolos per cubic meter. So, let's say, a container with a volume of one cubic meter submerged in water is pushed out of the water with a force of about 1,000 kilos. Air is a much less dense medium. The atmosphere is given to us as it is. Other planets have denser atmospheres, like Venus. Or, conversely, much more rarefied, like on Mars. While on Earth, the atmosphere is such that there is a standard atmosphere table, because the parameters of the air vary slightly, but it is usually considered based on the standard atmosphere. What is a standard atmosphere? It is at sea level with an air temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, where the density of air is about 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. This is how much one cubic meter of air weighs. Therefore, if we create, for example, some flying device, a hypothetical flying device that has a volume of approximately 1,000 cubic meters, it displaces air weighing 1,225 kilograms. If we create such a 1,000 cubic meter device with the weight of the structure and the weight of the gas inside, which together total 1,225, it will simply rise into the air as an aerostatic device and fly through the air. The lift force is influenced by the density of the gas that is utilized, such as in the atmosphere. The lightest gas is hydrogen, which weighs about 80 grams per cubic meter, but it is potentially hazardous in nature. It burns and is explosive in various applications. It's not so much that it burns, but rather that over a very wide range, when it mixes with air, it forms explosive mixtures that simply detonate, not explode like explosives. Helium is non-flammable, inert, and completely safe gas. Therefore, helium is much harder to obtain. The technology of the 1920s and 1930s was just beginning to develop methods for producing helium on an industrial scale. Therefore, everyone flew with hydrogen. 
one can truly take off their hat to those people because the technology was quite complex, the devices were very large, the calculation methods were imperfect, there was no computing technology, and in general the materials, we'll talk about materials separately, were not the most advanced. Yet people flew, making flights to the North Pole, around the Earth, flying across the Atlantic. This is truly remarkable. Is it luck? One must certainly take off their hat to the courage and engineering genius of the people who created such flying devices. But you already say that it was very difficult to calculate all this, impossible, yet people managed to do it. How was that possible? Well, it can't be said that it was impossible. Rather, the calculation methods were empirical, based on large assumptions. People didn't calculate, so to speak, down to every rivet or bolt. They generally had an idea of strength. They didn't delve too much into local strength. And, so to speak, knowledge about atmospheric turbulence was still imperfect. Materials, although Duralumin had already appeared, are now much more advanced, and all of this can be made lighter and stronger. But let's not stray from our discussions. And of course, if in the 1920s, 30s, they could have produced the necessary amount of helium industrially, such terrible accidents that led to the decline of the airship era would never have happened. Because look, the largest airship ever built was the truly massive Hindenburg LZ-129 which is indeed simply an incredibly colossal and impressive machine with a hull length of over 250 meters. What actually happened, as was later established, was that one of the internal braces had, unfortunately, burst. In fact, as it turned out, this ultimately led to the disaster. Jumping ahead, do you not believe in conspiracy theories that it was possibly deliberately blown up to advertise its danger? Did everything happen inevitably? Well, you see, the technology is complex, anything is possible. And imagine, one brace burst. If it had been filled with helium, no one would have even noticed. Even if it had completely lost lifting gas from one of its 17 compartments, the pilot would likely not have noticed that something had happened. But hydrogen, which escaped through the rupture of the gas bag, mixed with the surrounding air, and it only took any electrostatic spark for it all to ignite, and right before people's eyes, everything burned. It's even harder to imagine a worse advertisement. But supporters of conspiracy theories say that it's very peculiar how the chain of closing this whole matter happened here and there within a certain time frame. Indeed, everyone just forgot about airships. Everyone wrote them off. No, there's no need for any conspiracy theories. First of all, because inspired by the successful flights of the LZ-127 airship, which indeed showed impressive successes. It's a marvel of engineering. The device, built in 1928, flew, and many rushed to catch up. The Americans rushed after the Germans, the British rushed as well. But they didn't have that kind of school, that is, the Zeppelin company had been building airships since 1900, I believe, 1902 or 1903. They built them, and if we take the number LZ-127, that means 126 devices were built before it, there was colossal experience. And of course, a lot was achieved through practical experience. And when people, so to speak, decided to catch up, and there were no methods for precise calculations, they tried to start from scratch. To create devices that were not worse, but even better, they certainly made some mistakes. And think all happened around the same time. Because they all took to the skies simultaneously at the same time. And even the tragic demise of the British airship R100 wouldn't have been so tragic if it had helium instead of hydrogen. Then it was unfortunately overloaded, but let's not delve too deeply into the technical details of these airships right now. And the most important thing, which I believe, is that there was no conspiracy theory. Everyone understood that war was approaching and an airship is still a means of peaceful transport. It's practically useless for war. Why? They are too large, too slow and too light a target. Therefore, even during World War I, the Germans actively tried to bomb England. And the successes of those bombings, so to speak, are quite questionable compared to the efforts that were expended. But with the development of air defense, they simply became useless devices. And all efforts were directed towards creating combat aviation. Even this famous LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin, which circled the Earth three times and crossed the Atlantic 130 times, was simply dismantled. 
although it could have flown further and further in 1940, it just needed duralumin. There wasn't enough duralumin for combat aircraft, so it was taken apart. And all that duralumin went into building combat aviation. And after the war, passenger aviation had already achieved significantly greater heights, ranges and speeds and capabilities in the field of aviation that airships were not often remembered or considered by the general public. There were post-war airship programs, and during World War II there were some truly fascinating and innovative projects that were developed. Interestingly, I can also tell you about them during that time period. Furthermore, it is not widely known by many people that the Americans used their airships, which they built during World War II, for anti-submarine defense. Additionally, the advancements in aviation technology during this era were remarkable. That is, the convoys that crossed the Atlantic, which were accompanied by airships, indeed suffered virtually no damage at all from German submarine attacks. After all, the airship served as a means to detect submarines, relay their coordinates, so that some combat ships protecting the convoys could drive away these submarines. They turned out to be very successful. Many airships were built, and they flew over the Atlantic. They indeed flew after the war. The last airship that the Americans retired from the Navy was in 1962. These were the largest soft scheme airships. It was LZ-3V, if I remember all the designations correctly. It was indeed the largest soft scheme airship, with a volume of approximately 42,000 cubic meters. What soft scheme mean? Let's talk about this a bit more. Airships, possible types of airships, soft, semi-rigid and rigid. That is, soft airships are when the envelope of the airship is like an inflatable balloon. It is made of some materials with helium inside and a ballonet, like a balloon, just like a balloon indeed. Yes. So, the shape is maintained due to internal pressure. The first materials that allowed the creation of such airships were still based on cotton. They were cotton threads, and the coatings were made of natural rubber, in other words, rubber and other materials. These materials, although innovative at the time, were not without their flaws. Since we are talking about materials, let's discuss some textile terms. That is, the strength of textile materials is now measured in units, such as centinewtons per each decitex. What is a centinewton? A centinewton is exactly one hundredth of a newton. Tex refers to a thread of such thickness that at a length of one kilometers it weighs one gram. And decitex is a thread that has such a thickness, even less. Yes, that at a length of ten kilometers it weighs one gram. Therefore there is a thread of theirs. Let's build a scale of the strengths of modern threads, from the very first to the most modern that we can use in aeronautical engineering. If we take cotton threads made from cotton, even from the best long staple cotton varieties, the strength of the thread is about 3 to 3.5 centinewtons per decitex. That's how it is. 3 to 3.5. This is the best among natural fibers. That is, not viscose. Maybe silk is better, but silk is expensive. So still, in the airship's fabric, cotton was the basis. Somewhere before the war, before World War II, nylons appeared. Nylons have a strength of about 6 to 7 centinewtons per decitex. They are twice strong. Twice as strong, yes. Somewhere in the 50s, I don't remember exactly the 50s, maybe the 60s, the early 60s. These are polyester synthetic fibers. Here they are known by the name Lovesun. Lovesun? Lovesun, yes. These are polyester fibers. Lovesun, where can we see it? In clothing. A lot of lovesun fabrics are still used in clothing. Some kind of jacket, an ordinary jacket. Just a very strong fabric. So lovesun or polyester is about 10 to 12 centinewtons per decitex. Somewhere in the 70s, high strength fibers appeared, which were immediately used to make bulletproof vests, all known by the name Kevlar. Kevlar is about 22 centinewtons per 20 decitex. Does this mean that the airship could not be pierced by conventional firearms? Well, after all, there is indeed one layer. In a bulletproof vest, there are... it's possible. Yes, in a bulletproof vest, there are many, many layers of Kevlar to make it bulletproof. Usually, in a textile base, like in ballooning fabric, there is one layer. 
even more modern materials after all. Kevlar is good, it's robust, but it handles impact loads very poorly. If you take a Kevlar thread and pull it sharply, it will break under less force than if you just pull it slowly. Even more modern synthetic fibers have emerged and become available, marketed under the brand name Vectron, which we know better. I won't go into the chemistry, in general, Vectron, which is a type of high-performance fiber, and Vectron. It's about 23 centinewtons per decitex, and Vectron turned out to be so successful because, firstly, it provides very good adhesion with polymer materials, such as plastics. What is adhesion? It is the bondability. That is, we apply a polymer material, mainly polyurethane, to the textile base, and the bond between this upper polyurethane layer and the load-bearing layer of Vectron is such that when we weld the fabrics, a 20-15 millimeter overlap is sufficient, and we get an equally strong seam. So we take this seam, tear it, and it tears not along the seam but through the main material. Thus, it is enough to weld a 15 to 20 millimeter overlap due to the excellent adhesion between polyurethane and Vectron. But this is currently the peak, so to speak, of ballooning materials based on Vectron, which is, as it stands, the best available, but there are stronger synthetic fibers. For example, Xylon is approximately about 29 centinewtons per decitex in terms of strength. What does this strength give us? This gives us the ability to create a dirigible, a soft dirigible of greater and greater volume. The larger we make the size, the more robust the fabric we need. Of course, this can indeed be achieved by using coarser threads, denser fabric, or several layers of fabric, but all this leads to an increase in the weight of the fabric, whereas this way we can create very lightweight fabric. With modern Vectron materials based on Vectron, where the load-bearing layer is Vectron, it is already possible to create a soft dirigible of about 100,000 cubic meters, slightly. And we are talking about the same lightness as that first cotton with these weightless threads. We are talking about the exact same weight, only it will be much stronger and more durable. It will be lighter, even lighter indeed. For example, those American dirigibles that flew immediately following World War II, which they used for anti-submarine defense, still had nylon. And the fabric for the main body of that large dirigible, which was 30,000 cubic meters, weighed about 800 grams per square meter. Now, a fabric based on Vectron can be created with similar or even greater strength, weighing about 300 grams per square meter. So this is all progress in materials. It is simply colossal. Therefore, with modern materials, these dirigibles must be much better, much more reliable, and much more advanced. What is the Achilles heel of a soft dirigible? What is the danger? It is that we must constantly and carefully monitor the internal pressure inside to ensure safety. Well, during flight it is clear that we are constantly monitoring it, but when it lands and is on the mast, even on the mast, when we have completely powered down the dirigible, we still need to monitor it at all times. We cannot allow the internal pressure to drop, otherwise this dirigible will be destroyed immediately by a more or less strong gust of wind, perhaps. And how would it be destroyed? Look, if we have a completely smooth and even shell that has absolutely all of the necessary internal pressure, which is calculated accurately, which is safe beyond doubt, and which is maintained within the required limits, which is crucially important, then indeed its resistance, I won't mention specific numbers, is very small along its axis. As soon as this pressure drops significantly due to oncoming flow dynamics, a spoon shape or dent forms at its nose, and consequently increases aerodynamic resistance of such a dirigible more than tenfold. And what happens here? Visually it will be torn off, it will be ripped from the mast and carried away. So it will lose control, be blown away. Yes, 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 it will be blown away. Therefore, under no circumstances should such a dirigible lose internal pressure. This pressure must be monitored, i.e. While it is on the mast, everything is constantly tracked. But nevertheless, it has the right to exist, right? It does indeed, of course it does. All modern dirigibles that fly, such as Skyship, Schipelin NT, the German WDL... Does this feature bother anyone? Well, because they fly, they take off, complete their advertising or filming, or take passengers, as the Schipelin NT does over Lake Constance, 
and then dock. It just requires additional effort. We haven't talked more about the soft ones. Why did semi-rigid dirigibles appear? Semi-rigid dirigibles were a compromise because a rigid dirigible is very labor-intensive to create. And the strength, so to speak, of cotton threads did not allow for the creation of large volume soft dirigibles made of cotton. And then, in a manner of speaking, Umberto Nobile proposed this innovative and groundbreaking scheme of a semi-rigid dirigible, which had a large developed keel beam at the bottom that allowed for the very gentle and efficient transfer of all loads from all concentrated masses to the not very strong shell. And because the keel beam added rigidity, it was possible to maintain a very low pressure inside such a dirigible, which even cotton fabric could withstand. These dirigibles by Umberto Nobile, whether in Italy, Norway, or the USSR V6, were approximately 18,500 cubic meters. That is, they were approximately 110 to 120 meters, around 115 meters in length. And the pressure they maintained during flight inside this dirigible was about approximately 5 millimeters of water column. Just imagine, you have a curved glass tube and you poured colored water into it. One end of the tube is connected to the shell, while the other is simply open to the atmosphere. And the difference in levels between this side and that side will be only 5 millimeters. And with soft dirigibles? Here are modern airships. Since I have worked extensively and thoroughly in the field of airship technology with the AU-30 airships that we created and developed at the inventive center of OGMU, we had, so to speak, a pressure range that we carefully, meticulously and consistently maintained in the envelope, meaning the pressure at which the fans were guaranteed to reliably and efficiently turn on, and the pressure at which the valves were guaranteed to open, that is, not lower than... The pressure for turning on the fans was not higher than the opening of the valves and it was approximately somewhere between 45 to 60 millimeters, which is more than 10 times. And due to this, and thanks to the use of modern materials, we had a polyester base on the U-30 and the airship flew normally. We maintained this pressure. In total, we had two fans, four valves and there were ballonets. Many people ask what ballonets are and why they are needed in airships with a soft scheme. Let's talk a little about that as well. That is, the gas volume constantly breathes. If the air temperature increases a bit, the sun warms it up, the helium expands. If the sun goes behind the clouds, the helium contracts. If we rise a little higher, the atmospheric pressure decreases a bit, and again the helium expands. It is a stabilizer. This so to speak, is essentially the ability, the way to sustain this pressure in the envelope within very narrow limits. As soon as we, for some reason, either rise up or the gas temperature increases, the gas expands. Inside the envelope, there are air cavities, meaning there is a membrane that separates the gas cavity inside the envelope from the air. And we can maintain the pressure inside the envelope by releasing air. And when? On the contrary, we descend, or when the gas temperature drops, in order not to lose internal pressure, we need to increase and maintain the pressure in the envelope, we activate and engage the fans. One of the main systems of any soft airship is the air gas system. That is a system that automatically monitors the pressure in the envelope using sensors, and first of all, signals and alerts. It signals to the pilot that he has low pressure or high pressure and automatically turns on the fan, automatically opens the valves to maintain this pressure within the necessary limits. In semi-rigid airships, it's roughly the same, but since they can operate at lower pressure, it becomes a bit easier to manage. In rigid airships, this is not necessary, especially perhaps in modern rigid airships, where there will be a combined system, i.e. Strength will be created by both the rigid frame and the pressure, while in classic zeppelins, where strength was provided only by the frame, there were simply additional gas bags that lived their own life. That is, when we rise, they expand. When we descend, they contract. And there was no need to monitor the pressure inside. So what materials are rigid airships made of? 
Well, if we take classic zeppelins, then it is, of course, the famous discovery of duralumin, which in the 1930s was called alclad aluminum. This discovery was pivotal in the advancement of airship technology, particularly for the classic zeppelins. Duralumin, later known as alclad aluminum, revolutionized airship construction by providing a material that was both lightweight and strong. This innovation occurred when scientists realized that by alloying aluminum with small amounts of zinc and copper, they could enhance its properties. The resulting alloy retained the lightness of aluminum, but significantly increased in strength, approaching that of steels. This advancement allowed for the creation of more robust and durable airships, which were essential for that era. And all modern aviation is indeed built on these duralumin alloys. All modern airplanes recently are being replaced by plastic materials, because carbon fiber, first fiberglass, and then carbon fiber are even more advanced materials. But let's imagine that duralumin has a density comparable to aluminum, approximately about 2.8 grams per cubic centimeter, while carbon fiber is somewhere around, typically depending on the brand and type, about 1.4, 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter, which is twice as light. At the same time, if the strength of duralumin is around 350 megapascals, then for carbon fibers it can be over 1,000 megapascals, making it four times stronger. That is, if a modern Zeppelin were to be made from carbon fiber, you can imagine how much lighter it could be, how significantly more we could allocate for various systems. We could make it much stronger, the hull due to the fact that we have a large mass reserve, but does the choice affect it? Does the material affect the final cost? Of course it affects, but for a moment, let's say. I think that the cost of materials for aviation structures is still a matter of percentages. First piece, right? Somewhere around approximately percentages. The most important thing is to consider the labor intensity. That is, how labor intensive it is. After all, large aviation structures are produced somewhat differently. Special large molds are created and layers are laid down. And the reason why carbon fiber structures are very expensive is that the tooling is very costly. If we move on to airships, new zeppelins or new rigid hulled airships will be created using a completely different technology, in essence. These will still be tubes. They will be carbon fiber tubes. That is, producing a carbon fiber tube costs nothing. It's a mandrel. And you simply roll the fabric onto it, then cure it, and you get a very light, very strong material. Moreover, due to the fact that you have a very large range of these tubes, there can be different diameters and thicknesses. You can very precisely apply a tube of exactly the size needed in each specific place, and then create spatial truss structures from these tubes using various types of connecting elements. It's nothing complicated, nothing more technologically simple can even be imagined. Therefore, I am absolutely confident that I certainly and undoubtedly believe that creating a hull airship from carbon fiber tubes is indeed possible. Of course, it needs work to ensure that the connecting joints are reliable to accurately calculate the structure, to apply it very skillfully and efficiently, and not to overburden it, while at the same time making it safe and effective. In the future, this will be crucial. But indeed, in terms of labor intensity and weight efficiency, such a hull will be significantly better than what was made in Zeppelins in the 1930s. You say it will be done, but no one does it that way in the global market. There are currently projects that are indeed trying to create these types of airships. Sergey Brin, one of the founders and owners of Google, does not publicize much that he is working on such an airship. That is, it exists in the hangar, it is being created. Unfortunately, it has not flown yet because they are working on it, but such work is underway. I am generally interested in your behind-the-scenes games. You say he doesn't publicize, but you know. How do you know all your competitors by face? Well, it's word of mouth. Someone brings something on the tail. In short, in any business, in any field, is it all like everyone else? Well, yes, indeed, of course. And those who are cooking in the same, let's say, bowl, in the same pot, they all know each other to some extent. Then tell us about Russian competitors. Who else is involved? Let's start with some information. Six months ago, the president issued a decree, let there be airships. What was that about? What kind of decree is that? 
But after that, everyone started to move. There was a forum in Novosibirsk where engineers gathered to discuss the current market. Here, this whole story has resumed. Now crowdfunding has been introduced. Well, as far as I know, I can't speak for everyone, but to the best of my knowledge, I wasn't at that forum in Siberia. Let's say there is significant interest in the aviation industry because everyone understands that airships have their own unique niche. They are not airplanes, they are not helicopters. For example, an airship will never fly as fast as an airplane. Everyone understands that perfectly. An airship will never be able to land on a small area like a helicopter only because of its size and due to their unique characteristics. Everyone, as we all know, comprehends this as well, and efficiently, but it can outperform significantly both airplanes and helicopters, for example, in various aspects, such as flight duration. For instance, neither an airplane nor a helicopter can remain airborne for five to seven days for extended periods of time. However, an airship, on the other hand, can easily achieve this. With the rapid and current development of unmanned technology, it is safe to say that there is no need to fly fast in many scenarios. For example, I believe this is my firm opinion that all transport aviation should be unmanned. Why? Because an airship flies at, say, 120, 130, 150, or 180 kilometers per hour. And imagine you need to fly, say, three, four, or 5,000 kilometers. That means you are going on a flight for several days. This means that you need to have several shifts of crew on board. That is, someone is at the controls, someone is operating the aircraft, and someone is resting at that time. So, cabins are needed. Provisions. Provisions. Comfort. Yes, indeed. The most important thing is to pay everyone a salary. And the salary of the flight crew is not exactly pocket change. Therefore, economically viable will be unmanned airships of the same size and volume, but which fly without people, simply operated by an operator, let's say, managed by artificial intelligence but controlled by an operator on the ground. And such airships, yes, they can significantly increase the share of the takeoff weight of this device and significantly increase the share of commercial payload. Because it's one thing to have people on board. There are completely different safety requirements, system redundancies, energy installations, and everything else. It's another matter when, let's say, you lose 60 tons of cargo. After all, this is human life, and these are incomparable things. So you are specifically talking about some cargo deliveries, things like that? At the same time, for passenger flights, they can serve two purposes, such as safety and enjoyment. They can be for entertainment like taking tourists and passengers on rides, which is what Zeppelin Niti does over Lake Constance, for example, in Germany. That is beautiful places, beautiful and breathtaking views on aerial excursions. Neither an airplane nor a helicopter can provide the level of safety and unparalleled comfort that airships offer in terms of safety and comfort. Wow sensation. Yes, wow. But the airplane flies high, fast, see something there. Well, yes, yes, yes. And here, after all, there may have been various projects, including making a glass floor in part of the gondola so that one could walk. How liftable can this be for the average person? Right now, with airplane prices, everything is quite sad. And how accessible can this be? Tourist rides. It can be accessible when it becomes mass-produced. For now, it's all produced, so to speak, in small batches and individually, which is quite expensive. Here, the company Zeppelin Inti for an hour flight. 400 euros, in my opinion. Well, 40,000, that's the average statistical resident. Their queue. But people are coming from all over the world. People are arriving from all over the world, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, if it becomes mass-produced, ticket prices can be reduced by 10 times. That is, serial production provides, well, just a colossal, everything that is produced serially leads to a tremendous reduction in costs, the cost of all this. At the same time, airships can be in demand for passenger transport, especially on short routes. Look, organizing an aviation line for distances less than 400 kilometers doesn't really work either. That is 400 kilometers, but everything is still more or less 
economically feasible. And let's say 200 kilometers. I am asked if a line from Tula to Moscow can be made with an airship. It can... I will be flying to you by airship. Well, we won't be able to compete with buses. However, there are places where airships will not face competition. I always give this example. The distance between the two cities, Tallinn and Helsinki, is 90 kilometer, but they are separated by the Gulf of Finland, and the ferry takes four hours. What about car? How do you get to Pavadia? There is no bridge at all, nothing, no options. Can you imagine? They don't build bridges like that for 90 kilometers. So we have either you sail or you fly. Fly 90 kilometer. No one will take you 90 kilometers by plane? No, it's not economically viable. It won't even have time to gain altitude. Although there are lines for 90 kilometers, it should be subsidized by the state. In other words, no commercial operation of such a line. No, only if you have a chopper. Yes, yes, yes. But it is possible to create a passenger line on a dirigible for 90 kilometers. And there are many such places in the world. Okay, how much time will it take for the dirigible to ascend, fly and descend? It need not ascend much. Best flight altitude for a dirigible is about 500 meters. It shouldn't go higher. How much time will this take? For 90 kilometers, this ship sails for four hours. It might not be four, maybe three, depending on the speed. Well, okay, three to four, less than an hour. It can operate like a tram, flying back and forth every hour. After all, this is abroad. We can now try to find similar points in Russia. After all, the Helsinki agglomeration has over a million residents, and the Tallinn agglomeration has more than half a million residents. So if, if there is such an opportunity to fly back and forth like on a tram, and for about the same price, I think this line will be in high demand. For the same price, not any time soon. Not any time soon. For example, there are indeed many islands, such as the Isle of Man, located between England and Ireland. There were projects. They also wanted to create a dirigible line in connection with England because it takes four hours to sail by boat, which is also quite an experience, especially when it's stormy and the boat is shaking. No, there hasn't been a serial dirigible, can you imagine? The Gulf of Bothnia has so many islands, and the Indonesian archipelago has similar places. Even in Russia, I see, last year I drove to Karelia and stopped by Petrozavodsk. And on the other side of Lake Onega, everything beyond Onega is practically cut off. To get to Petrozavodsk, you indeed either have to sail on this rocket, which only operates during the warm months of the summer season, or drive a considerable distance around Lake Onega to reach your destination. If there were such a dirigible and a port at the airport, all the small towns beyond Lake Onega would be connected to their capital in Karelia. Many places exist. It's good that we arrived in Russia because what is happening in Europe and America today is, let's say, not very interesting. What am I getting at? Right now, we have some kind of trouble with airplanes. There are rumors that there are no components, that there are no qualified people, that the airplanes themselves are aging and there is no one to service them. All of this is becoming more expensive. The number of aircraft is decreasing because due to sanctions, we cannot afford to cooperate with large companies. There won't be such a problem with airships. Firstly, things are not so bad with airplanes because projects are indeed underway and everyone knows about the MS-21 project as well as the UZGA company, which has taken on many projects to develop airplanes, let's say, for local aviation. Tickets are not getting cheaper yet. Tickets are not getting cheaper because there are no such airplanes. The superjet is being actively produced. But since I am not a specialist in this field, let those who are involved explain everything. My question, perhaps, is whether it is possible to create an airship from scratch to finish in Russia with the efforts of Russian specialists and Russian components. It is possible and necessary in various fields. Perhaps not everything can be done by Russian specialists by themselves and expertise, but maybe not everything can be done with Russian components, because we will still need assistance and collaboration from other countries, primarily probably China in certain areas, because some, let's say even the same aerostatic materials, are unfortunately still not manufactured or developed here at this time. 
but can be purchased in China. That is, all of this can be done, and it is possible in Russia because there have been attempts to create production of modern aerostatic materials in Russia, but they faced the issue that the demand is very small, and they simply could not sustain themselves economically. If there is normal demand, then, let's say, it does not require any super-duper technologies. These are all understandable technologies, and the production of such fabrics can be done with popular. Is it possible to do everything here for a new generation airship in terms of development and production? Possible. Planning this, how see it? You need to start, as they say, small and take steps. I won't talk about our plans yet, because there will probably be a special separate stream or a separate webinar, or however it will all be organized. I don't know yet. I hope it will be a podcast, because in that case I will participate. It will certainly be a podcast when we talk about our plans. But yes, indeed we are planning and currently working on the ambitious initiative of developing the first airship from our lineup. It is expected that almost everything will certainly be domestic in nature, even if something happens not to be domestic in these initial samples, because we absolutely do not want to delay any timelines, it will then have to be imported. However, rest assured that ultimately in Syria it will most definitely become entirely domestic. That is, some elements may be used just for speed to certainly increase velocity, but later we will think about how to replace them with domestic ones in the future. We will know how to replace it with domestic ones, which are made with precision and care. After all, an airship on one hand is something new and innovative, but on the other hand, there are no technologies that we don't have access to or understand, because both the fabrics and plastics, which are essential components, are all produced here locally, as well as the engines, which are crafted with expertise and precision, and are known for their reliability and efficiency, and are integral to the airship's performance. The whole question is that it needs to be combined in the right proportions so that it is optimal for this device. For this, we just need to organize production. You know, I think for every typical average viewer out there, in fact, the implementation and work on airships in our country and indeed around the world looked something like this. The era of Zeppelins has faded away and suddenly we are talking about them now, but in reality, what was truly the curve of work on airships? You have been working diligently on this your whole life. This is roughly how in demand it is. That is, the president signed a decree and everyone immediately starts to move, to do something. Then some kind of commotion starts again, where all attention and resources are directed and everyone forgets about airships again. So, does it look like this or is it a systematic effort? due to which we hear or don't hear about airships? Well, it is certainly better for it to be systematic work, so that it does not depend on the signing of certain decrees, although decrees also greatly help in promoting this. Aeronautics in the Soviet Union and in Russia has a rich history. Unfortunately, these were not mass products. They were unique products, so few people know about them. Well, let's start with the Soviet Union with the Dolgoprudny Design Bureau of Automation. I worked on the 2DP airship project approximately since 1983. That is, three projects were made, but unfortunately the airship was never built. Why money? It wasn't even about the money. I was a young specialist back then, I was still an engineer, and maybe I didn't know a lot, although I was already actively participating in this project. But at that time, I was working on a certain part. I was dealing with loads, meaning that after graduating from the institute, I worked in the dynamics and aerodynamics department and dealt with loads, calculating the loads that the airship needed to be designed for. I was a young specialist, just graduated from the institute. Three projects, three design options were made. I can't say why it wasn't built. Let those who were in charge of the enterprise at that time answer. It's very interesting why and at what point everything stops. For you, it's clear that the work doesn't end, but we don't see airships in the sky. For what reason? The late 90s, I have information about a thermal plane, for which the government even allocated $18 million. My engineers came up with everything, lifted it, it crashed, they shook hands and dispersed. Well, let's say that one shouldn't, in any situation 
behave in a manner similar to that of a hooligan. Aviation technology absolutely does not forgive mistakes in any way. It was conceived, again, I had no relation to the thermoplane project, so I won't say anything. But what I personally, as a specialist, didn't like is that I really dislike when people venture into the vast unknown or embark on uncharted territories when they come up with some new forms without sufficient justification. From time to time, disc-shaped airship projects resurface. I believe this is a dead-end path because these disc-shaped structures are very aerodynamically unstable. Any gust, so to speak, can overturn it, and it's very difficult to ensure its stability. That's why I always advocate for the classics. And if we are venturing into creating something that hasn't existed before, we need to approach it very carefully and thoroughly. There should be an extensive volume of research, and first, a small-scale thermoplane should have been made, tested, and meticulously all problems understood, rather than immediately building this gigantic airship that was supposed to lift these dozens of tons. Well, it really burned a hole in the pocket that burned a pocket $18 million. I don't think it was specifically her that burned a hole in the pocket, but it is true that what was conceived was, of course, wonderful, but people ventured into areas that had been little researched. Well, but as you say, the cigar-shaped form has already been researched. You already know a million things about it. It only remains to gather the money and make it. Why don't we see airships in the sky yet? Why don't we see them flying? Although you say that the problem is often not about money. Airships flew. There were airships in the 90s from the Aerostatica company, and airships flew in the 2000s and 2010s from the Augur Aeronautical Center. These are purely Russian projects. But it didn't grow massively. Why? Well, because, let's say, to create an airship, it's not enough to just build and construct an airship. In reality, you indeed need to create an entire industry. And for that, you need to come up with tasks that will justify, even at the very initial stages, the investments that go into creating an entire industry. Do you currently have an understanding of how to justify this launch? So, we need to definitely search for the most high-margin applications for this airship. I believe the highest margin application for an airship is undoubtedly tourism, because no cargo or carrier will pay as much for transporting goods as a tourist will spend out of their pocket for an hour-long flight. Therefore, the first airships, in my opinion, that should appear should be for tourism. Then, as this industry gradually develops in the near future, the production of airships will transition to serial production, some kind of mass production, and only then, in a systematic manner, should we consider moving to transport applications. Because let's say, if we start talking about the economy, and efficiently in terms of the broader economic implications, to transport ore and be competitive with a railway train, well, an airship will never be cheap enough for that to be economically justified. An airship can indeed transport certain types of cargo, especially if it's a hard-to-reach area. And there, let's say, there is practically no infrastructure. So yes, it can carry out unique operations. Large, indivisible cargoes do exist in the world. Even, for example, contemporary wind energy is developing so much. You know that the sizes of the blades being installed on the most powerful wind turbines now exceed approximately 100 meters or so in length and transporting this blade from the factory, let's say, to the place where the truck train will be assembled. Yes, there are problems, but transporting it to mountainous areas, please do. It's much easier when you place it in the sea. For some reason, the sea is developing now because you can transport anything on a ship. What I don't like about maritime transport, it pollutes the water. Maritime transport pollutes the water. If it's large, we're definitely talking about that. It's absolutely clear that you can put some electric motor on a boat or a small vessel, but not on a cargo one. And let's talk about how it pollutes the water. With the exhaust of a diesel engine or by dumping something overboard. Both? Well, it dumps waste products, and they need to be disposed of somehow. If they set a requirement to prohibit dumping, 
so that everything is somehow disposed of at the airport, and this is clearly monitored, then I hope there will be no dumping. As for diesel engines, the requirements for diesel engines, let's say, in cities are one thing, while those on marine vessels are another. Because there are no cities there, but there will still be exhaust. If we legally prohibit the use of dirty diesel engines and legally raise the requirements for diesel fuel used on vessels, yes, this will increase the cost of maritime transport, but it will be more environmentally friendly. But I have a feeling that airships could indeed be in demand in this direction, to replace these. Yes, but we need to approach this in a way from a somewhat different angle. Look, the world is now so interconnected with such a large volume of traffic between continents and countries and regions that a problem arises in the ports. A ship arrives, having crossed the Atlantic in four to five to six days or more, and then it sometimes waits for two weeks for its turn to enter the port. And for some cargo it doesn't matter, they can wait, but for others it's important and they cannot wait or they are perishable goods, such as bananas, tomatoes. Why wait two weeks? The port is overloaded. There is a queue. The queue at the port is currently the bottleneck of maritime transport. Therefore, there are colossal investments in port infrastructure. New ports are being built, because indeed, straits and ports are the bottleneck due to the very large volume of transport, and everyone faces issues there. Now, if you try to close the Suez Canal due to some military actions, it would cause a collapse of global trade. If it's so difficult with parking for ships, won't it be difficult then with parking for airships? And for an airship, it is not tied to the coast. You see, a ship cannot go just anywhere. It must arrive at a port, and there must be appropriate infrastructure at the port. An airship can deliver to a point where it can unload. These points can be anywhere. The most important thing for it is an empty space that is not occupied by anyone. Directly to some factory that has become the customer for this cargo, it's clear. But if it is another country, there must be some customs, there must be some inspections. What is the problem? I think all of this is currently being resolved now, gradually, in the process of being resolved at this moment in time and space, as we speak right now in this current situation and context. It's all a matter of will. Customs points can be opened anywhere if there is sufficient traffic for transportation, and I believe there are no problems with that. Firstly, barriers are gradually being removed in the world. Everything is globalizing, and these are not technical issues. You see, they are organizational issues. Organizational issues may be more complex in some ways and simpler in others, but they can also be resolved. There is nothing complicated about it. Technical issues are harder to solve because, after all, if we are transporting cargo, I say again, it must be unmanned aviation. Unmanned aviation still needs to be proven safe, although there are already unmanned trucks, unmanned taxis, and unmanned delivery robots. After all, a dirigible that carries 60 tons of cargo is a dirigible with a hull 200 meters long. Well, or 150, I can't say the exact numbers, but it is a very large device, a heavy device, and it needs to be proven that it will fly, that its artificial intelligence won't go crazy, that it will take off from point A and return to A. Hackers that won't hack. Well, it is necessary to ensure that hackers cannot penetrate this environment. It's also interesting that such an immense and dedicated number of people come together and collaborate effectively, efficiently and precisely to bring this project to life, besides the engineers who have been working on this for 40 years. There are also people who need to know how to manage effectively, efficiently and accurately people who must be able to monitor and control remotely, expertly and precisely from the ground. Where is all this taught? In our prestigious and renowned universities and educational institutions that are renowned and respected, and let's say, it should. It should be structured, as I call it, like a tree or a three-tiered structure. Let's say, if we imagine a tree, there are roots, a trunk and branches. So, what is the root? The root is the company that designs and manufactures dirigibles. It is the foundation of everything. There are few such companies in the world, for example, in the aviation world. We all know Airbus, Boeing, Irkut in Russia, Superjet Sukhoi. 
there are not many of them. So the consumers of these companies' services are certainly aviation companies. These are the companies that organize the operation of these vessels. They also need to have trained personnel. They must have the necessary certificates, flight qualifications. All specialists must be certified and they organize safe operations. There are also consumers, commercial organizations that order certain services from aviation companies. These are transport companies, logistics companies that acquire or purchase, I don't know, flights, metric tons, kilometers, and so on. And all this financial and monetary flow should move from the roots to the leaves and back to the roots, going back and forth in a cyclical manner. When such a structure is successfully established in the market, a whole industry, then it will work effectively and be commercially justified. You just need a certain critical share of investments to build this entire structure. That's why I say that we should start with the most high margin tasks, where it is easier to do, where it is cheaper to do, and then, when it develops, move on to other levels. Where it is not so... We are talking about a tourist state. Is this your opinion or the opinion of the entire think tank, the state of the new generation? This is my opinion, and I hope that all other specialists support me. I am ready to argue with those who think otherwise. Are there heated debates? Of course, about any topic. From where to apply it to what bearing number to use. Do you understand? Debates happen over any issue because people have many opinions. I believe that debates are useful if they don't turn into arguments for the sake of arguing. Because in debates, of course, the truth is born if people are seeking it. If they want to come together to some correct, most optimal solution. You all already have such a baggage of knowledge, a baggage of mistakes, a baggage of successes. I thought you had nothing left to argue about and would part ways. Technology does not stand still, you see, even the AU-30 airship in which I was very actively involved, is still a project from 2004. Twenty years have passed. Everything can be done differently. Everything can be done better. Therefore, new opportunities arise, new materials emerge, new ideas come up. And of course, the fact that the company Nova wants to build an airship again, I don't just hope. I firmly believe that we will achieve enough. A big step compared to the AU-30 airship. Are you not arguing about the name yet? No, let's... Why should we argue about the name? Well, of course, the old truth, how you name your yacht, how you name your airship, that's how it will sail. Therefore, it should probably have some kind of lively name that will motivate us. So, what can you suggest? I will not make a suggestion. I have announced a contest, and I have the right as per my taste, to choose the winner. This is certainly not a guideline for action. It doesn't mean that the first airship has to be named exactly that. But I like the name, so the promised gift will go to Sergi.x. I really like Pioneer because, in my opinion, people who follow me a bit more than those interested in next-generation airships know that I am involved in music, as I see it. Pioneer is our acoustic product company, and also, pioneer means the first, which is logical. Yes, if we recall the Soviet years, what was the slogan? Pioneer is an example for all the guys. So let this airship be an example for all other aviators, and continue, so to speak, a new path to the development of aeronautical technology. Sergi.x. We will write our email under your comment, and please send all your contacts to our email, where to send the gift and what size to send it. In general, we are in touch with you. Now, we will continue. The connection with Dmitry Duinov is of great interest to everyone. There are a lot of comments. Can there be an airship powered by the Slavyanka engine? And let's talk about what engines can be used in airships. Well, let's start with the fact that, historically speaking, virtually all airships that have ever been built were all based on piston engines. They also evolved and had a long history. Aviation piston engines. I don't know of any current or past significant large-scale commercial or military projects involving gas turbine engine-powered dirigibles. Indeed, 
No such modern-day operationally viable large-scale commercial aircraft has yet been constructed successfully utilizing this technology in practice today. From extremely old to the most modern ones in various forms that are continuously being created and innovated upon even now. And the airship we are going to create will also be based on an aviation piston engine. But that doesn't mean that airships will always fly only on piston engines. Why? Because there is currently a trend towards the decarbonization of transport in the aviation industry. And now, everyone is looking for ways, in various sectors, startups are emerging, and innovative solutions to reduce the carbon footprint of transport in general. Everyone knows about electric vehicles such as cars and buses, but fewer know about hydrogen vehicles and their benefits because they are less commonly seen on the roads. Although many companies produce them and are investing in their development, they are also in operation in various countries. Even in Russia, we have several companies participating in this field. Well, in the sense that they are imported from abroad, we currently don't have our own developers. And so I strongly believe that if we are indeed to transition to flying vehicles, then the airship is potentially the most promising candidate for the implementation of a hydrogen engine. That is, there are no volume restrictions and the conditions for placing hydrogen on board the craft are much more favorable. But this is still a matter for the future, potentially in the near future, as a viable option for such technology in the foreseeable future as we continue to explore and develop these advancements. Let's move towards this step-by-step -step process, meaning that the very first airships we are going to design and create will still be powered by traditional internal combustion engines, by conventional piston engines, but I am absolutely and firmly convinced that the very first commercially successful flying vehicle powered by an innovative hydrogen engine that will ever take to the skies will indeed be an airship. And I would really truly like it to be my airship. So we are also seriously thinking about this, considering that it is indeed possible. Still, hydrogen the return of hydrogen on board the flying vehicle after all these terrible disasters, so to speak, will require breaking some inertia of thinking. Of course, with modern materials, modern sensors and modern leak controls, it will all be much, much safer. But this safety must first be ensured and secondly proven to be safe, because any flying vehicle cannot just take off into the air until it has gone through a sufficiently complex and labor-intensive certification process. After all, as they say, the history of aviation is written in blood, so all these rules that have been established cannot be violated. They are not just there for no reason. It's all about passenger safety. So again, I jokingly say that there are old religions. I don't want to offend anyone. There are old religions and there are new technical religions. So, in aviation the main religion is safety. Everything must be safe. And the next most important thing is weight saving. Meaning we need to save weight because the lighter it is the more economically efficient it is. Therefore safety comes first and hydrogen on board will certainly be... It will raise questions, but we need to carefully consider how to do this in various ways so that it successfully and thoroughly passes all necessary and required certification and regulatory procedures. And here, in my opinion, I still think that a hydrogen airship will most likely not be a passenger one in the foreseeable future. Rather, a hydrogen airship will be a cargo carrying one, as it will be easier to prove that in terms of safety and efficiency and, so to speak, the associated risks are, once again, significantly lower from a regulatory standpoint, because the loss of a single airship and its cargo, this is incomparable to the value of human life. And of course, we will do everything to absolutely ensure that there are certainly no accidents, no losses but so to speak, a transport airship with a zero carbon footprint is undoubtedly our future. How can Duyunov's engines be applied? Duyunov's engines can be applied in the most straightforward and direct manner because, in a manner of speaking, hydrogen will be converted into electrical energy in so-called devices called electrochemical generators. These are special devices in which hydrogen is burned efficiently and effectively without high temperature and the output is electrical energy. In these advanced and innovative devices, hydrogen is burned in a controlled and efficient manner, ensuring optimal performance. But electrical energy will not directly push the airship forward. For this, 
electric motors are needed to turn the propellers. Therefore, again, high-power engines are required because if we are building transport airships, we still need engines with hundreds of kilowatts. Duyunov himself mentioned that he was creating engines with power. In a personal conversation, he told me that the most powerful engine he designed is 30 megawatts. That is, this is an enormous engine. Secondly, they must have a very high power-to-weight ratio to be applicable on board an aircraft. After all, an asynchronous motor, so to speak, a regular asynchronous motor, cannot be installed on an aircraft because it is very, very heavy. Modern motors with permanent magnets, so-called BLDC, are already approaching the level where they can be used on board an aircraft. These are relatively light engines. However, there are significant limitations regarding heat dissipation and the unit power of these engines. So, the most powerful engines I know of at the moment, electric aviation engines, are, I believe, 700 kilowatts. I haven't heard of anything more powerful being created yet. If Mr. Duyunov can create engines of 1 megawatt, 1.5 megawatts, and 2 megawatts that are efficient in terms of weight, then it would simply be a matter of taking and creating a hydrogen airship. That's what is needed. Well, as much as we could, we probably conducted a basic technical education today. We learned the basics of airships thanks to the chief designer of airships, Vadim Vasilievich Zubkevich. Thank you very much for engaging in dialogue with me today. I learned so much, so much thanks to you. You know, one can talk about airships endlessly. Therefore, there is still much more to discuss. We can indeed talk about new projects and what we are currently working on. We just don't want to get ahead of ourselves right now. When we are ready to present something to the public, we will definitely share it. So I hope this is not our last meeting with you. We hope so too. Thank you very much. You are with the next generation airships. Follow us on all platforms. <laughs>